Hello everyone. This lecture is on culture, commerce and phonography in India. It is a part of your paper on media culture and society. In the previous lecture, we discussed the phonographic effects produced by the technology of sound recording. We learned that sound recording generated distinctive and new experiences with music. And it would be interesting to see how the phonographic effects of recorded music negotiated with the drama and cinema in India which relies heavily on songs. And keeping this in mind, in this lecture we will discuss the interplay of music, drama and cinema through the new technologies of recorded sound. We will discuss how the infusion of technology transformed the relationship of music with drama and cinema. Since gramophone was essential in the initial conversions of music, drama and cinema, it is advisable to first know the history of how experiments with recorded music started in India. For this, we will briefly discuss how India was introduced to the technology of recorded music. And following that, we will discuss the integration of recorded music, drama and cinema. And by the end of this lecture, you would have learned how commercial interests negotiated with cultural aspects. And this will take you away from a technologically deterministic analysis of a social phenomenon. Technologies do make an impact, but no technological invention can work without engaging with the socio-cultural aspects. In a way, this lecture will clarify the applicability of the concept of phonographic effects in the Indian context. Now, let us begin. Introduction of sound recording technology in India was introduced to recorded music in colonial India. Initially, it was not Indian songs that were recorded on disc. We were listening to foreign imports. India had a market for the mechanically produced music, but after the invention of phonograph, some retailers started importing phonograph around late 1890s along with other European luxury products. The phonograph that the retailers were importing were of two types, the cylinder based and the disc based phonographs. Out of these two, cylinder based phonograph was popular among Indians as it has the facility of recording and replaying music unlike the disc based phonograph which could play a pre-recorded disc. The element of novelty in recording and replaying was like experimenting with your own voice. So it was the only factor driving the popularity of cylinder based phonographs. And it was not until 1900 that Indians cultural exper experience with recorded music was based on the imported hardware, machines and black cylinders. And it was in the 1902 when software that is the pre-recorded music became the center of attention. Which before that the European and the American exporters were operating with the objective of selling hardwares. And selling pre-recorded music discs was not part of their own agendas. And in any case, the pre-recorded music that people in colonial presidency like Bengal were listening to consisted of comic shows, acts of mimicry, sounds, dance melodies and so on and all were in English. But in 1902, Gramophone and Typewriter Limited, a British company having its origin in US initiated recording expeditions in India. Frederick William Gasberg of GTL brought the attention on the music on record and GTL was the first to undertake native recordings in India and before 1902 GTL was selling English records primarily catering to the 
anglicized tip of British India. And later with the recommendations of Gasberg, they realized the importance of recording local music. And then the content of music or the record became the locus of attention. Where Gasberg started familiarizing himself with the music by visiting capital cities in India to find the most admired singers performing at theatres, private stories and fairs. The purpose of such exercise to explore the musical cultural landscape of India was purely commercial. And in its first expedition, GTL received a corpus of 500 recording on wax masters as its pressing factory in Hanover, Germany. The prominent singers recorded were Gohar Jan and Lal Chand Boral. And the experiment was successful leading to another recording expedition by GTL in 1904, which encouraged other competitors of GTL to explore NATO recordings in India. And according to Parthasarthi, Precisely because of GTL's innovation, competing firms from Europe and America were forced to alter the mechanism of their operations in India. And while reco recognizing that business with British India was more extended and profitable than with most Asian countries, rival firms also embarked upon recording expeditions. Where Nicole Freres from London sent a recording expedition to India in 1904 and the American Talking Machine Co. in 1905. Thus, GTL catalyzed a race amongst firms to acquire greater amounts and varieties of native music in what was visualized to be largest market for records in the old world. And in its second round of recording expedition, Gasberg was interested in going beyond the capital cities and wanted to explore the unknown hinterlands. And for him, success meant going out of the capital city into the Mofisal towns of the hinterland in the United Provinces and Punjab to scout for and record fresher talents. And in the north, Gasberg went first to the Lucknow and thereafter to Firozpur where he recorded about 200 titles in two languages over three weeks. While traveling to the south in Hyderabad, he made another 200 odd records in Telugu, Kannad, Marathi, Arabic and Persian and a clear sign of the cosmopolitan character of Hyderabad. And finally in Madras, now Chennai, the expedition made 300 recordings in Tamil, Telugu and Kannad harvesting a rich repertoire of South Indian recordings hitherto missing in the GTL's catalogs. GTL now had a thriving business in India but gradually it began losing its advantageous position due to the competition in the markets. Parthasarthi states GTL was slowly losing its first mover advantage as it found two fresh variables had come to determine competition in the market for records their price and their transportations. The attention moved to reducing costs of records that of raw materials and their transportations and equally minimizing the time lag between the recording and retailing of a record, a lag that could extend up to six months in the Asian colonies. So the GTL started exploring the ways to reduce the transaction cost in the lucrative and rapidly expanding markets in India. And throughout the 1907, companies were trying to outprice each other by reducing and counter-reducing the price of records. This created a scenario where the prices of records in India were not greatly differently from those in Europe. And this was the immediate background in which GTL opened its records factory in Sialda, Calcutta, the first mass manufacturing factory in India. Till then, Calcutta served as the clearing house of the global trade in Shellac and therefore 
was the best available, available location for setting up GTL's factory. Shellac, a derivative of lac, was the object of utmost utility for the Britishers to operate a global monopoly like it was being operated for Mecca. And establishing a disc manufacturing setup in Calcutta would ensure ready and cheap access of shellac. The raw materials in and eastwards of Chota Nagpur could be directly purchased from the processing plants eliminating the network of intermediaries and the proposed facility was visualized as the manufacturing hub for GTL's operations throughout the Asian seaboard. Calcutta was the eastern port making it cheaper for GTL to transport ready discs to East Asia especially the growing market in the Malay states and the gramophone company's factory at Sialda included units for assembling machines, cabinet making and record pressings and it was the largest such facility outside Europe and America. And it is in this backdrop that the standardized music was industrially produced and socially consumed in the colonial India. Now that we have understood the history of its introduction, now let us look at how it was going to affect drama and cinema in India. The Convergence of Recorded Music, Drama and Cinema Music is central to films in India. There is a fundamental assumption that films will always have songs. K. Abbas film Munna produced in the year 1954 was the first Hindi film ever made without songs or dances and it failed at the Indian box office completely. The primacy of music in films in India can be traced to the live music drama forms that were prevalent in India. And these drama forms were the basis of the cultural assumption that films will have songs. Gregory Booth says, from 1931 to the late 1940s, composers, singers, musicians who had been working in live theatre were finding new jobs in the film industry. And of the sources of influence in Mumbai, the most important were the rather classically oriented Marathi language, Sangeet, Nataks and the urban popular music. There were Parsi theatres. Tamil language music dramas in Tamil Nadu were influential in that region, while in Kolkata and Bengal, generally the Bengali form called Jatra played a similar role. And it is clear that music drama traditions were central in popular culture and films absurd on it. And the relationship between music dramas and recorded industry that developed was going to be replaced by a close association of films and recorded companies. But before coming close to the films, the record companies engaged with the music drama traditions. They started recording the theater artists. For instance, Marathi singers were recorded on discs by gramophone companies. Similarly, in Chennai, Tamil stage players were recorded, but it was gramophone companies' rival, Columbia, which was compiling these Tamil musical dramas and in such a way these companies were harping on a ready-made content of songs. Such kind of interactions between stage drama and recorded music has produced economically and culturally significant outcomes and you can imagine the situation wherein the music dramas when recorded on this would have been received by the people and there is no doubt that now the musical drama which were hitherto confined to the time and space boundary can reach to a larger audiences. It has gone beyond the context of the stage. It would eliminate the otherwise effort taking process of staging, costume makeup and many other activities involved. And the consumption of an individually recorded song required much less time and attention than the drama industry did. And it was not even dependent on whether the song consumers had watched the drama being performed. 
there was always an associated identification of the physical realities of actors on the stage and a validated emotional sum suggestive of the dramatic content and the two would together be constitutive of the overall effective and contextual existence of the song as a part of the music industry the recorded songs could form a pleasant background to social activities in a way that even drama sets which routinely included dialogues could not and the songs have a personalized independent existence which make emotional exchange a possibility superseding the dramatic constant altogether and for these reasons their potential audience outnumbered those of the stage drama and such experiences with the recorded music were further going to be reshaped by the cinema especially the sound cinema the mumbai film industry the filmmakers could be seen entering into ideals with the recorded companies where both were expected to benefit in economic terms due to the wider consumption of the now mutual products and the early film musicians were often drawn from drama troupes but those who had been accompanying silent films also crossed over to the new mediums and although with the coming of sound cinema the centrality of music in films was going to be escalated but you must know that before the advent of sound cinema music although not recorded was still accompanying the films and prior to the arrival of sound film technology in india many theaters would show silent films supported by live music and the live music and narration was essential on account of literacy related issues mostly out of outside of the urban centers Noshad Ali one of the famous music composers in film industry narrates this aspect in these words Before there had been someone in the theaters to play the music maybe on tabla or a harmonium if there was a fight scene they would play music for that or if there was a chase they would play differently that was very good and people liked it very much then they also had one boy for singing and so if there was a love scene he would sing a ghazal a romantic poem usually in persian or in urdu and also on the side would be one announcer who would give an accounting of these scenes this girl has fallen in love with this boy and her parents do not approve and now they will meet to decide what to do now let us look at the case of tamil music drama and its integration into the recorded music industry and films this will certainly serve as an example to understand the arguments we have discussed till now a case study of integration of tamil music drama a gramophone companies and a tamil film relation the new sound media of gramophone and sound cinema took up the genre of tamil drama and the mechanical reproduction was music has altered the traditional cultural forms such as tamil drama and the recording companies were mediating the relationship between drama and the films scholars have certainly pointed out to an interesting unintended outcome of the gramophone industry and the film industry the cultural hierarchy and the dominance of carnatic music was challenged by the mechanical reproduction of music and following walter benjamin's analysis in art in the age of mechanical reproduction scholars have argued that the cultural panic about the degradation of musical standards and taste was part of the concerted efforts of the elites who had enjoyed privileges and monopoly through carnatic music the elites exercised their cultural dominance by classifying carnatic music as part of high bro and classical culture thereby the mass produced music was defined as popular according to stephen p huggins the emergence of tamil film songs thus helped to redefine a hierarchy of music practices 
in less than a decade the collaboration of drama gramophone and cinema produced a new range of film song dominance at the center of an emergent cultural industry built around the tamil cinema where the musical reproduction set the new standards for live music performances the mechanical reproduction of tamil music was no longer merely a derivative form but had emerged as a creative force and a definitive mode of mass production in this way it was not just a continuation of musical drama into gramophone industry and film industry but more than that tamil drama was basically musical dramas such as kovalam and when recording companies started their businesses during the 1920s and the 1930s they took up the drama songs thereby mediating the relationship between tamil drama stage and the cinema and while doing so the gramophone companies created entirely a distinct musical genre along with that they have created a generation of musicians and singing stars who were earlier tamil drama stage singers and this was at a time when the films were still silent the recorded companies were establishing tamil drama music at their best selling records and the most important dramatistic during this period was tt sankardas swamikal whose compositions established the canon for tamil musical drama and whose drama companies launched several generations of the most important drama artists of the 20th century the other gramophone singing star were k b sundaram bala s g kitappa s v subaiya bhagwathar n s shanmugam they all started their career as stage artists so before tamil drama music and musicians could be incorporated into cinema the gramophone companies had already transformed drama songs into a mass produced standardized and widely circulated musical commodities This collaboration of recorded companies and stage artists was the first link in the creation of a Tamil cinema and the vast majority of all Tamil films during the 1930s more than 200 in total were based on earlier stage dramas and reworked for the 3 hour film formats and in many cases drama companies would be hired to perform their already popular stage productions in front of a relatively immobile cameras so the gramophone recordings paved the way for the tamil drama artists to mark their entry into tamil films and during their first 30 years in india cinema the gramophone and the cinema industries had no direct associations beyond the fact that gramophone records were sometimes played as audible accompaniments during silent cinema shows although some enterprising film exhibitors experimented with using the two media to complement each other the gramophone and cinema business each developed their own specialized and separate markets and after the advent of indian sound cinema this separation broke down and the two media began to overlap in their use of drama musicians and music tamil films and gramophone companies both had a mutual reliance of tamil drama productions so that it can easily said that tamil drama played a decisive role in bringing the two media industries the gramophone industry and the film industry together and instead of working in competition with each other the recording and the film companies learned to work together and they laid the commercial and the institutional foundation for producing and for sustaining the music of tamil cinema both as a filmic necessity and as an accompanying mass culture of music av miyappan exemplify the convergence of gramophone and cinema businesses and his credit goes the establishment of one of the most important and long standing film studios in madras 
and he started from music recording and then later moved to Tamil cinema. He was the founding member of Saraswati Stores which was the southern agent of Odeon Records and Saraswati Stores had a profitable business in recorded music. It produced recordings in 1930s that actually ran parallel to Tamil cinema. It financially supported Mia Pan's earlier efforts to produce Tamil films. And Mia Pan launched Saraswati Stores in collaboration with Odeon Records and soon its Saraswati Records stores were leading in the recording business in South. And the Saraswati Stores was the first to establish its own dramatic company for promoting drama record sets in the 1933s. And its first recording was the famous Tamil drama Kovalan in 1934. And by 1935, Mia Pan, inspired by his success in the recording business, started exploring film production with Tamil film Ali Arjuna. This was ex actually an extension of Saraswati Store's drama record set productions. And the actors, singers in Ali Arjuna were from the Saraswati Store drama troupe who had already performed various dramas. It is a classic case of convergence and cross ownership of recording and film companies. Although Tamil cinema heavily relied on Tamil drama, but it was also responsible for changing, displacing and marginalizing this very same drama. And during the 1930s, virtually all Tamil drama companies were absorbed into the cinema industry in one way or the another. And the most drama performers joined or attempted to join the Tamil cinema. Furthermore, the old drama theatres were converted for the purposes of film exhibition which proved a more affordable, profitable and popular entertainment. This way, the same cinema which relied on stage drama for its growth completely took over and killed the stage. And in the conclusion, at the end of this lecture, I hope you have learned about the culture commerce interface through the technology of sound recording that was introduced in India during the colonial times. And since GTL was the first company to start the production of native recordings and set up a mass production factory in India, we have discussed its entire history. And to explain the culture commerce interface, we discussed the examples of convergence between the Tamil drama recording companies and the Tamil cinema. The same cinema and recording companies which mutually relied on Tamil drama was responsible for the complete marginalization of it. And this explains that new technology of sound recording played at multiple levels with traditional cultural form for its growth and commercial interests. Hope you have enjoyed the lecture. For more details, please read the modules carefully and attempt to questions given at the end of each module. Thank you very much.